Um, and I do hope that you folks were able to check out chapter seven um, uh, review, well, class recording that I put out uh, on Blackboard. There should be, there's three parts to it for chapter seven. It's a little bit more detailed than the previous ones, but uh, if you haven't checked it out, take a look at it. It's, I did not upgrade your, your, your uh, that is correct, Christina. I have not um, checked over any of your lab information, uh, but I will be doing that over the next couple of days. Okay. Um, I just had another section that I had to get out before you. All right, so let's talk about. You were upset. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. but like I said, I, I've yet to have a situation in which when I graded somebody on lab where their lab test went down. It has not happened to me as of yet. I can't say it won't ever happen, but I don't think it will happen. Um, all right, let's start off with chapter nine. Classification of joints. Uh, first, let's describe a joint, just so you have a pretty decent idea. And most of you do, just from common sense, that it's a place where some bones connect to one another and where there's movement occurring. All right. So the definition of your textbook is it's a place of contact between bones. All right. And it can be between two or more bones. It can also be between bones and cartilage. Right? Some of the joints that we're going to be looking into, we're going to see um, cartilage involved in our articulation. And then finally, you can also see it between bones and teeth. Um, and that's a relatively unique joint, especially when we're dealing with uh, those of you that might be going into uh, dental hygiene or dental assistance or even dentistry uh, will become familiar with. Okay? So when we're studying joints, uh, that field of study is called arthrology. Um, and if there's an actual issue with a joint, okay, um, a pathology involved, then we call that uh, an arthropathy. So degeneration in a joint can be an arthropathy. So when we're talking about joints, we classify our joints two ways, okay? Classify them by structure. And when we talk about structure, we're talking about the anatomy, okay? And then when we're talking about, all right, function, because that's the other way that we uh, classify joints, we're talking about the physiology. Okay. Physiology. I'm not even going to write out the whole thing because this is taking me forever. Okay. So anatomy and physiology are how we're going to classify our joints or uh, structure and function. So let's start off with how we classify the joints structurally. All right. There's three classifications, fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. Okay. So when we're first dealing with fibrous joints, all right, we're going to be dealing with fibrous tissue, specifically dense connective tissue. These types of joints are going to be attached or connected or held together by dense connective tissue. Our lagenous joint, all right, we're going to see the bones are going to be connected by cartilage. And then finally, synovial joints, all right, these are the most common type of joint in the body, all right? These types of joints are going to have a capsule, all right, that will surround the joint. There will be fluid inside the capsule. And not only that, part of that capsule will be made by ligaments. So those bones are held together by the ligaments, also a joint capsule inside that capsule. Right, and that joint space will have some fluid in there. So those are the three structural classes for joints. The three functional classes are going to be synarthroses, amphiarthroses, and diarthroses. Okay, and this has to do with motion and mobility. So when we're talking about a synarthrosis, right, these joints are immobile; they don't move. Okay. And mainly, 
It's because of the tissues and the shape of the joints, right? But those include fibrous and cartilaginous joints from the previous page there when we're talking about synarthroses. The next type of joint classification, when we're talking about functional classes, are amphiarthroses. And these joints have just, just a little bit, just a little bit of mobility, right? slightly mobile. Right? And these joints will also be fibrous or cartilaginous. And our final, final classification functionally are diarthroses. These are our freely movable or mobile joints. And all of our synovial joints fit into this classification. Okay, so all the joints that have ligaments that are holding them together, okay, and a capsule that's fluid filled, those synovial joints will be freely movable or freely mobile joints, otherwise known as diarthroses. So when we're talking about joints, we can't help but talk about movement, okay? So there's varying ranges of motion or varying degrees right, of movement in joints, okay? So it's going to range from absolutely no movement, right, all the way to what we can classify as extensive, right? So either no movement all the way to extensive movement. And really what determines the amount of mobility in the joint is the actual structural classification. The anatomy of a joint. In other words, the anatomy of a joint is what is going to determine its mobility and stability. Because there's a special relationship between mobility and stability. That special relationship is what we call an inverse relationship. What that means is the more mobile a joint is, the less stable it is. So the more movement you have in a joint, right, the less stability you have at the joint, and vice versa. Usually joints that are very, very stable right, are not mobile. Okay, so we call that an inverse relationship. So this third bullet point here is very important for you to know. All right, star it. We'll see a test question on it. Inverse relationship or trade-off between mobility and stability. We see that in the suture joints of the skull. Okay, They're very stable joints because there's hardly any mobility there. All right, but when we look at the glenohumeral joint, your shoulder joint, where your upper extremity attaches to the scapula there, right, that joint has lots of mobility there. But unfortunately, it's not a very stable joint. Okay, So it's more prone to uh, dislocation. Very highly unlikely that you would be able to locate a skull suture joint. All right. So let's now start talking about Right, some of the different types of joints that we're going to come in contact with. We're going to start off with the fibrous joints here. Okay. So we're, when you hear fibrous, I want you to start to think of fibrous tissue, and that's going to be our dense regular connective tissue. But we're familiar with dense regular connective tissue back from Chapter 5 because we see dense regular connective tissue in tendons and ligaments. And those tissues are very strong, okay? They can be, they can add stability to structures, right? So in these types of joints, we will not see a joint cavity. So where the bones articulate or connect to one another, there won't be any space inside there, right? The fibrous joints either don't move at all, okay? Or they move just a tiny bit, just a tiny bit. All right, so we have three types, amphoses, and for those of you that are going into dental hygiene or dental anything, you'll need to become familiar with this type of joint, okay? We have amphoses, sutures, which we saw when we were talking about all uh, the different sutures of the, uh, or um, the different sutures in the skull, and then syndesmoses, 
right, when we saw that, when we were doing the skeleton, right, when we were talking about the forearm and the leg. All right, cartilaginous joints. There's, uh, in this situation, if you look at the, the word cartilaginous, it contains cartilage. So we're going to involve cartilage in this joint somehow. And remember, there's three types of cartilage, but we're going to only involve two. We're either going to have hyaline cartilage or fibrocartilage. All right. Same type of scenario. All right. There is no joint cavity in cartilaginous joints. Fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints do not have a joint cavity. And so they too can either be immobile or just slightly mobile. Okay. And so there's two types when we're dealing with cartilaginous joints, our synchondroses and our symphyses. We'll go over examples of those. Then finally, we've got our synovial joints. These joints, all right, have a joint cavity. All right, these are the most common type of joint that are in our body. There are diarthroses, which means they're freely movable. Right, so they'll have that capsule that surrounds the joint. Therefore, they'll have a joint cavity, and inside that joint cavity, they'll have synovial fluid present. Right? And not only that, where you find these joints, usually around long bones or the at the ends of long bones. Okay, and if you remember from chapter seven, on the ends of our long bones, we'll have articular cartilage. Which is, which is just another form, or excuse me, another name, hyaline card. And then to help with the articular capsule stability, you've got ligaments that help to hold the joint together. And of course, you're going to have some nerves and blood vessels. Nerves will help to regulate um, the actual proper positioning of the joint. And obviously, the blood vessels will carry, carry nutrients to the joint and wastes away from the joint amongst other things, okay? So those are all the features that we'll see in our synovial joints. So here's a quick, not a quick example, but a basic example right, of our synovial joint. All right, so here you'll see two, two long bones here, okay, articulating with one another, and there's a capsule. That surrounds the joint cavity here. All right, on the out the outer portion of that capsule, that's what we call our fibrous layer, which is you know, we've seen this pattern before when we were talking about periosteum, the outer layer of the bone. Okay, right, you have that covering to the bone. The periosteum, the outer layer of that periosteum, is made up of a dense irregular connective tissue. And then there was the intercellular layer that had all the bone growing cells and the osteoclasts and whatnot. Well, instead of the inner cell layer, on the inside of the uh, articular cartilage, or excuse me, articular capsule, you have the synovial membrane. Remember, there's four membranes in your body. You get the mucous membrane. We learned about the serous membrane earlier on in the semester. Chapter six, you learned about the cutaneous membrane, that's the skin. And the fourth membrane is here, the synovial membrane. The synovial membrane lines the internal area of the joint capsule. It's found everywhere, and it lines everything on the inside of the joint capsule except the articular cartilage. Right? Because if it did, it lined the cartilage every time that the bones would smush together, it would damage the synovial membrane. So we don't bother having any synovial membrane there. And it's the synovial membrane that's going to produce the synovial fluid. So it produces the synovial fluid and it bathes everything on the inside here of the joint. On either end of the bone, you see the articular cartilage. That's our hyaline cartilage. Okay. And then you can see a ligament here on the outside. So those are going to be the components, the different, the many different components that help to make up our synovial joint. All right, so let's talk about a couple of the characteristics here of our joints, all right, of the synovial joint. So you heard me mention it a little bit here. Let me go into a little bit more detail. The outer layer, 
that fibrous layer. It's made up of that dense connective tissue. All right. So again, dense connective tissue, right? You've got the regular and the irregular, right? But both of those types of tissue okay, are quite stable and strong because of the amount of collagen fibers that are involved. So this type of tissue and this layer, right, helps to strengthen the joint, keeps your bones from getting pulled apart, or what we call subluxated. Okay. The inner layer, that's the synovial membrane. That's going to be made up of a loose connective tissue, the areolar connective tissue. All right. So like I said, we find it all on the inside of this joint capsule, everywhere except on the articular cartilage. It's not found on the articular cartilage because we don't want to pinch it, damage it, because it's got a very important job. And its job is to produce that synovial fluid. There's several functions for synovial fluid, okay? Helps to nourish the joint, helps to act as a shock absorber, okay, reduces friction. It's not quite as watery as water. It's a little bit more viscous, which means thicker. It's more like motor oil, okay? So at the ends of the long bone there, we have our hyaline cartilage. And we already know the functions of hyaline cartilage because we talked about that we were talking about tissues in chapter five, right? The purpose for hyaline cartilage on the ends of the long bone are to help reduce friction, okay? And those joints are moving and those bones are moving and sliding past each other or pivoting or swiveling or doing whatever they, they're meant to do, all right? If it's bone on bone, that's very painful. Just ask anybody that's been diagnosed with degenerative joint disease. DJD, osteoarthritis, any of those conditions in which there are older people, especially if their knees hurt them, they'll say, oh, the doctor told me I don't have any cartilage in my knees anymore. Right? So they've essentially worn away okay, most of that cartilage there, and the bones are now starting to grind on one another. That's not good. That's painful. Okay? So they reduce the friction. They also act as a shock absorber. Okay. And they protect the ends of the bone there, okay? So you don't have to have bones grinding on one another. Now, remember when we were learning about the different types of cartilage, and I told you that our, our hyaline cartilage, right, elastic cartilage, both have a perichondrium, all right? Fibrocartilage was the only one that didn't have a perichondrium. Well, in this course, you're going to find out that there's always exceptions to the rule. And this is one of those exceptions. The articular cartilage, right, which is found in your joint, is not going to have a perichondrium, okay? No perichondrium. That's a good true-false question right there, okay? But the mature cartilage in our body is going to be avascular, right? So let me repeat myself. Mature cartilage. So that means there's no blood supply right, directly coming to this cartilage. It has to get its nutrients from synovial fluid. Right? And the best way for it to get the nutrients to, from the synovial fluid is from the process right, of diffusion. And what can maximize diffusion is movement. Okay? So the more mobile a joint is, and the activity levels, if someone just lies around and doesn't move those joints, then they're not going to have very good diffusion for that cartilage. But people that are somewhat active, right, get up, walk around, go for walks, whatever, you know, go to the grocery store, go to Walmart, whatever. But when you're walking, right, that compression and that movement of those bones moving past one another on that cartilage helps to stimulate diffusion. Okay. All right, the next component of a synovial joint is the cavity itself, the joint cavity. That's that space that we're going to find in between the bones there. All right, and this is that space that is lined by the synovial membrane. Remember what I said, everywhere except the articular cartilage. And that synovial membrane secretes right, the synovial fluid. Okay. 
So the synovial fluid is thicker than water, it's more viscous, right? And it's going to lubricate, all right, the articular cartilage. It's going to provide nourishment and waste removal from the articular cartilage's cells, the chondrocytes, and it also acts as a shock absorber. Right? Synovial fluid, I would say, is pretty important. We need that. We need to maximize the amount of fluid that's being produced, okay, because of all of the roles that it plays. <clears throat> it's a pretty good system. It just needs to be kept in place. Let's talk about some of the synovial joints, our classification here. Right, and this is for synovial joints. These are all the different types of movement that we're going to see within these joints. Right? So we base it upon the type of movement that occurs. Now, some of this stuff is, is pretty un understandable for you. And if you've taken a math class, all right, it's algebra, geometry, You've got your x axis, all right, that is from side to side. Then you got your y axis going up and down, all right, and then you got what's called the z axis. This is my best attempt at making a dotted dash line, okay? And the z axis is the, is the uh, uh, plane of movement that is coming out from the computer, okay? So that's what that diagram is showing you, all right? X-axis is left to right or right to left. Y-axis is up, up and down or uh, uh, down or up. And the Z-axis is coming straight out at us, okay? Or into the computer screen, okay? So when we're talking about a uniaxial joint, it's only going to move around one plane or axis, all right, so we're talking about a plane. That means it'll only move through, remember the planes back from the first uh, chapter? Coronal plane, mid-sagittal plane, all right? The transverse plane, it'll either move through just one of those planes or any of these three axes that I just showed you. It'll only move through the x-axis, right? Or the y-axis or z-axis, okay? So I'm sure from the rest of these, you can figure out, right, if it's biaxial, it'll do planes. Okay, or two axes. Then multi-axial, okay, that's going to be through all the planes. I shouldn't say all the planes. It could be multiple planes, but multiple axes, okay? So that'd be X, Y, Z. So I'll show you some. Um, the, the, this here, you just kind of want to be familiar with and how it's going to affect movement in these joints here. So I'm going to get into more of the specifics here, all right, as the, as the slideshow goes on. So when we're talking about right, the joint surfaces of joints, right, that is going to be the way these joints are shaped, the surfaces of, of those parts of the bones that are articulating with one another are going to dictate and determine the type of movement that occurs in these joints. Okay. So our list here that you're seeing on this uh, slide, right? At the top of the list, that is going to be the least mobile, right, type of movement. At the bottom is going to be the most mobile. So as we go down the list here, we will increase mobility, All right? So as we go from the top of the page down to the bottom, we'll become more mobile, All right? But remember, consequently, as we do that, okay, we are going to then see that the joint itself will become less stable. Because remember, mobility and stability, there's going to be a test question on that, are inverse, right? They have an inverse relationship. Okay, so as we go down the list, we see the joints become more mobile, but unfortunately they become less stable. It's an important concept to keep in mind. All right, so a plane joint, simple. All right, the surfaces of the joint are flat. Okay, they will have the least amount of mobility that's going to occur. All right, 
refer to these joints as uniaxial joints. They're pretty much all right, limited to a gliding movement. So we'll see those plane joints, those uniaxial movement joints, um, in your carpal bones and in your tarsal bones of your foot. Okay, they just glide past one another. Okay, their surfaces rub against one another just like that. And the next type is the hinge joint. <clears throat> that one is easy. Okay, again, it is uniaxial. Think of your elbow joint. Okay. You're flexing and extending your arm, right? If you grab a, a drink and you start to bend your elbow as you bring that cup closer to your, your mouth, all right, at your elbow, it's a hinge just like your door, okay? So you'll have one surface, all right, of that joint will be convex shaped, okay? So it'll have a rounded appearance. And the other surface will be concave, right? It'll have kind of like a, Depression. Oh, I remember the difference between convex and concave. I thought if you're in a cave, all right, this is my best attempt at drawing somebody, all right, like a concave. You go into a cave, you walk into a cave, like that tunnel. So that refers to the depression portion. Convex is the rounded portion on the outside, okay? All right, a pivot joint, all right? This one here, you saw back in chapter eight when we were talking about the, um, the joint between your atlas and your axis or your um, C1 and C2, okay? One bone is gonna just pivot around the longitudinal axis of the other bone. Okay, so here's that dense process on C2 and then C1, Okay, sat on either side. There was a ligament that wrapped around the back, right, of the dens and attached, right, to the atlas. So what would happen is that ligament holds the atlas against the dens. So when you're shaking your head no, all right, that is a pivotal mo uh, joint movement, okay, around longitudinal axis, which is this axis right here, the up and down axis. That would be the Y axis. Any questions so far? I know it might not be the most interesting stuff, but at the same time, it's not too terribly boring. Are you saying to me that I'm doing such a good job at reviewing this with you, that you're understanding every word? I know it might be tough for some of you because some of you might be sitting in front of the TV right now watching the Dallas and the New York Giants football game. Okay. Anyways, let's finish up with the synovial joint classifications. The last three, we have a condylar joint, the saddle joint, and the ball and socket joint, okay? Our condylar joint is going to be biaxial. And those joints, right, the, the uh, joint movement can occur right in two planes oh thank you very much i appreciate that um the, the um joint movement can occur between two planes or around two axes all right we'll look at that later on and then we have our saddle joint this is the joint that we see in your thumb okay the joint in your thumb at the base of your thumb all right, where we'll have a convex right, and a concave surface resembling, remember the sulla tersica that we saw in the sphenoid bone, the Turkish saddle. All right, it will give a, and I'll, I won't even attempt to try to draw it, right, but it gives a, a saddle shape to the, that joint and it, that provides a biaxial amount of movement going on. And then finally, the ball and socket joint, that joint, okay, is the most mobile joint, okay? It's multi-axial. It's gonna go through all three planes or all three axes, all right? So we'll have our socket, our cup, okay, here, and then we'll just have this ball-like structure that'll sit inside, like the head of the femur, 
okay? Or the head of the humerus. That's supposed to be the femur. Not bad. How the head of the femur sits inside the acetabulum of the os coxa, and also how the head of the humerus sits inside the glenoid fossa of the scapula, okay? These ball and socket joints are very mobile. Okay? They can move around quite nicely. We like those, okay? So let's discuss some of these motions that we see here. Right, you heard me talking about the gliding motion, right? We see this in our plane joints, okay? So the gliding motion, basically, we're going to see the articulating surfaces slide either back and forth on one another or side to side. This is the one I was telling you about that you'll see in your wrist, okay, as you're bending your wrist back and forth, right? That'll be a gliding movement, right? Um, if you do uh, what's called radial deviation or ulnar deviation, that's just moving your hand from side to side. Right, you'll get this gliding motion. It's limited, all right, but it provides that movement through a gliding kind of back and forth or side to side. Right, so we'll see that in the carpals of the tarsal bones. So in your wrist or down on your uh, the bones of your foot. All right, let's talk about the next type of motion. That's called angular motion. There's several uh, different uh, specific types, and we're going to go through those. Okay, this is where things kind of get a little bit interesting. Uh, for people because it helps them, all right, understand and learn okay, some of the, the definitions of some of these words here that they may have heard of, but they just didn't know what that word meant, okay? So when we're talking about angular motion, going back to geometry, all right, we're going to deal with angles. And if you remember this symbol right here, that represents a symbol for an angle, okay? So when we're discussing our angular motion, we're talking about the angle between the two bones, all right, that make up the joint itself, <clears throat> okay? So what's going to happen is either that angle will become smaller or it may become bigger, okay? So it's either going to increase or decrease the angle between the two bones that we're going to be discussing that make up that joint. So the specific types are flexion and extension, and we have hyperextension, and we have lateral flexion, abduction, and adduction, and then circumduction. So let's start off with flexion. Okay. Flexion we see through the anterior and posterior plane, meaning front to back. So anything that goes in front of us or behind us, that's the motion that flexion is going to describe. And basically what we're going to see with flexion, we're going to see a decrease in the angle. So we're going to bring the bones closer together. I like to, again, use the elbow. Right? When you bend your elbow, when you bring that cup to your mouth, right, you're going to flex the elbow, meaning your humerus and the bones of your forearm move closer together. Okay, now when I go to straighten out my arm, okay, I'm going to go in the opposite direction of flexion. Still moving front to back through the anterior posterior plane, but this time I am going to increase the angle. Okay, so when I go to straighten out my elbow, I'm moving the bones of my forearm further away from my humerus, right? Or the example given here is bending your finger. So when you go to clench your fist, you're flexing your fingers. When you go to shake somebody's hand after you made that fist, you open up your fingers, extending them out, all right? You go to shake somebody's hand, that's extension, okay? Bending your knee, that's flexion. Straightening your knee out, that's extension. All right, now we have this term. Some of you may have heard of hyperextension. There's a layman's term for hyperextension. You might hear an athlete hyperextending their knee during a sports competition. Right? But the anatomical term for hyperextension is extending the joint beyond all right, 180 degrees. In case you're not sure, 180 degrees is looking like this. Here's the joint right here in the middle. 
All right now for the most part when you straighten your arm all the way out that should be close to 180 degrees but some people have this ability they might have looser ligaments for example um, they just might be naturally more flexible but they can straighten their elbow past 180 degrees younger people are able to do that a little bit more like little kids there's some folks that do that with their knees if they're standing up when they go to straighten their legs they'll go past 180 degrees okay the example that the book likes to use is looking up towards the ceiling when you're standing right? that is when you just cock your head as far back as you can okay that is considered hyperextension all right lateral flexion in this specific case you're going to move the body or body part through the coronal plane. That means side to side, okay? Mainly we talk about lateral flexion when we're talking about the spine. And the areas of the spine that have really the most amount of lateral flexion are gonna be in your neck and the cervical region and in the lumbar spine, your low back, okay? So a way I would ask somebody, to test their lateral flexion as I say to them, all right, go ahead, look straight ahead at the wall, take your right ear and try to touch it to your right shoulder. So when you bring your head to that side, you're moving through the coronal plane, right? And you're just laterally flexing your head to the right, okay? All right, so here's some funny pictures. I shouldn't say funny, they're, they're good pictures, okay? But you can see, all right, gentleman starts in the anatomical position he looks down towards the floor that is flexion when he goes from the flex position back to the anatomical position that motion is extension but if he moves past the anatomical position and goes all the way to where he's looking up at the ceiling that's hyperextension okay here's your elbow flexing your elbow or bending your elbow that's flexion you go to straighten it all the way out that's extension Okay. For your hand, when your wrist is straight and you go to bend your wrist, that's flexion. You go back to that neutral position, that's extension. If you take it past that neutral position all the way back, that's hyperextension. Right, we already talked about this. Then here's your lateral flexion. Right? You ask this person, please lean to your left as far as you can. They're laterally flexing the lumbar spine. <clears throat> And this is all with angular motion, okay? All right, these two terms here, abduction and adduction, sometimes I'll say abduction and adduction, just so people can understand my pronunciation of these words, okay? Um, these have to do with moving something away from the midline. It could be the midline of the body. It could be the midline of the wrist. It could be the midline of the foot, okay? So when you abduct somebody, you take them away. Okay, you hear about abductions quite frequently. Then we'll, if, especially if it's kids, we put out an Amber Alert. They're being taken away from something. Okay, so in this case, when you're abducting a body part, you're moving it away from midline. Okay, so if you're standing there with your arms to your sides, and then you just start to raise your arms out to the side away from your body that's abduction now when your arms are out to your sides and you look like the letter t and you bring your arms back down to your sides now you are creating adduction it's a medial movement meaning you're moving it towards the medial portion of your body right you're bringing it back toward the midline so i tell folks when we're speaking about adduction you're adding something to the midline okay so if you bring your arms that you extended straight out from you from to side to side to make you look like the letter t and you bring them back down to your side that is adduction okay so you can see here this lady has her arm down to her side when she raises it up that's abduction. She's taking it away from the midline. When she brings it back down to her side, she's adding it back to her body. That's adduction. You're in the anatomical position, right? Okay? You um, tilt, all right, or flex your hand. I shouldn't say flex, but you bend it, right, towards your body. 
okay? That is adduction. When you uh, bend it away from your body, that's abduction. You can see here with the hip. Now here's the thing, remember, the midline is not always the body. In this example here that we're seeing with the fingers, okay, the, the midline is considered your third digit here. So when you spread your fingers open, that is abduction, abduction, okay, because all your fingers are moving away from digit three. But when you bring them all back, okay, pull your fingers back together, and you're adding them to digit three. That's adduction. All right, and then finally, the last part of angular motion is circumduction. And you can see here in these examples, this person is doing arm circles. I remember having to do that in gym class back when I was in school in PE. Coach would say, all right, warm up. So, so we'd start doing arm circles. So the proximal end is like the pivot point, all right? It didn't move too much, but the distal end of our arms when we did the arm circles would make a nice cone appearance here, okay? So the distal portion is the, is the part that's making the circular motion. It's going to be in the shape of a cone, okay? Same thing here with the foot, all right? The hip joint itself stays relatively um, stationary. When we get all the way down here, the foot is swinging around, all right, making that cone-like shape, okay? All right, let's discuss the next type of, of motion. Right, we saw gliding motion, all right? Then we saw angular motion in all of its specific examples. Now we're going to talk about rotational motion. Okay. In rotational motion, we are going to move a bone on its own longitudinal axis. Okay. On its longitudinal axis. So we're going to talk about lateral rotation, medial rotation, pronation, and supination. Right. So lateral rotation, I want to read this out to you. Right. Turns anterior surface of the bone laterally so what does that mean All right so the anterior surface i'll give you an example the best way to do this if you bend your elbow at 90 degrees bring your arms to your side bend your elbow at 90 degrees and both of your hands or fists should be facing forward your elbows should be at 90 degrees now i ask you to turn your hand out right to swivel it open Okay, that is called lateral rotation. The anterior surface of your arm, your bicep, is now going to move laterally. Okay, and then if I tell you, all right, bring your arms back in, okay, put your hands to your side, bend your elbows at 90 degrees, make a fist. Now, bring your fist across your stomach, all right? But just keep your elbow at 90 degrees the whole time. The anterior surface of your arm, your bicep muscle, now moves medially, okay? And you're bringing your arm across your body. I'll show you some pictures here. Pronation and supination, those are, are, are um, what we saw when we were talking about the bones there in the forearm, the radius and the ulna, okay? When you're in the anatomical position, you're in a supinated position, okay? The lateral, all uh, right, portion of your forearm, that's the radius, right? That's going to be in the lateral side, right? The ulna is going to be on the medial side. Your hand or the palm of your hand is going to be facing forward or anterior. That is a supinated position. So just put yourself in the anatomical position, right? Palms facing forward, right? Your arms are hanging down to your side. Now, all I'm going to say is turn your hands so your palms are facing backwards, right? And what you do is you, you turn your hands facing backwards, right? Your radius is going to cross over the ulna. And normally, in the supinated position, the ulna and the radius are parallel. But when you go into pronation, the radius will cross over the ulna there, okay? The ulna stays um, relatively uh, unchanged. All right, but what you've done now in the pronated position is that your hand is facing, excuse me, facing posterior. Tell folks another way to think about it is, all right, if you, your palms are up facing the ceiling or the sky, you bring your hands together like you're going like, to drink water out of your hands. Okay, if you've ever gone on a really long run or whatever, you don't have a cup, but there's a bowl of clean water. Besides 
jamming your face into the bowl, you start to scoop the water out. All right, somebody explained it to me once. They like to think of it as soup. I'm gonna, if I'm gonna eat soup out of my hand, and I hope it's not hot soup, all right, you're gonna cup your hands together with the palms up, okay? So that's soup, supination. Then when I turn my palms down to the floor in that position, that's pronation. So here you can see, all right, these rotational movements. You ask the lady here to turn her head from side to side, C1 will rotate on top of C2, on right, that longitudinal axis up and down. All right, here's that lateral rotation. So your elbow's bent at 90 degrees, you swing the hand out. All right, the anterior surface here, the bicep, now faces laterally. That's lateral rotation. And I say, all right, bring your hand across your belly. All right, now you swivel the whole thing inwards. The medial, excuse me, the anterior surface here of your bicep is now facing medially. Lateral and medial rotation for the for the hip are much easier because if you if I say hey turn your foot out, that's lateral rotation because the anterior surface of your thigh and your leg go laterally. And then when you turn your foot inwards for medial rotation the anterior surface of your thigh and of your leg face face medially okay here you can see our supination in the anatomical position palm is facing forward all right and then we move our hand and face the palm posteriorly that's pronation okay all right we have a couple special movements that are are, are involved here okay so elevation and depression, these apply to the mandible, they apply to the scapula. Okay, so when you depress the mandible, you are going to move your jaw inferiorly. You're going to open your mouth. When you close your mouth, all right, you are going to move the mandible superiorly. Okay, and you're chewing food. Okay, that's elevation. Right. Same thing with your shoulders, right? If you raise both of your shoulders, like saying, I don't know, you know, you kind of shrug your shoulders upwards when you raise both your shoulders, that's elevation. And then when you relax them and drop them back on, that's depression. So these are special movements. They don't fit those other categories, so they're special. All right, so here you can see this gentleman is shrugging his shoulders upwards. That's elevation. When he relaxes them, they drop down. That's depression. All right, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Right, both of these are very are specific to the ankle joint. Okay. So the best way that I can describe it, you can see here in the picture, plantar flexion, this person's coming up on their toes, all right, like a ballerina. But also when people go and run, if they're playing basketball and they're going to go plant their foot and jump, do a layup or dunk the ball, they have to uh, plant, all right toes on the ground and then push off right whereas dorsiflexion you know, i describe it to people is put your foot flat on the floor and then try to bring your toes up towards the ceiling point your toes up towards the ceiling the book describes it as digging in your heels right but basically you're just going to move the top of your foot up towards the uh, bringing the top of your foot closer to your shin right that's dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And you have eversion and inversion. Inversion is when you turn the sole of your foot inwards. Eversion, you're turning the sole of your foot outwards. Eversion is much more difficult to do. You have fewer muscles to make that maneuver. Inversion is easier to do. And in fact, that's the more common way for those of you that have ever sprained your ankle, most likely, um, if a certain percentage of you have sprained your ankle, 90% of you did it with an inverted, an, an inversion ankle sprain. It's just very common to do it that way, okay? All right, protraction and retraction, we're going back to the jaw, right? So when we're asking you to protract, we're asking you to stick your jaw, your mandible, right, out. Put it forward. Okay, and so your TMJ is going to slide forward. We ask you to pull it back, pull your jaw back in towards your uh, neck. Right, you're going to pull it in. Right, and you're going to pull that TM temporal mandibular joint is going to uh, move posteriorly there. All right, 
And then the last one right here, a couple different forms of arthritis. Right? It's good to know all of these. First of all, you need to know what arthritis is. You've heard it probably quite a bit. Okay. Arth arthritis is, is a category that we give to joints that are inflammatory, which means swellings involved, right? Or degeneration is occurring. Okay. So a group of inflammatory or degenerative diseases of the joints. Okay. So those symptoms will include swelling, pain, and stiffness. Well, here's the thing. If you have chronic or long-term inflammation in a joint, okay, when I say chronic, this is going on for a long period of time, possibly years, right? But it can start as soon as several months. But if it's left alone for years and years and years, there's studies out there that show that chronic inflammation, chronic swelling will cause degeneration, joint damage, okay? And when that happens, all right, swelling, right? will cause pain, all right? And then this degeneration will cause joint stiffness because now you're starting to mess with the biomechanics of the joint. The muscles that move the joint can tighten up because if it's painful to move, where well, your muscles are gonna be like, well, I don't wanna move it because it hurts. So they'll stiffen up. In some cases, they'll go into what we call the guarding reflex, which is a special reflex that prevents further damage from occurring by preventing the, mu the muscles from moving very well, right? So a lot of our arthritis that we see, right, the first one listed here is gout. Um, for those of you that have ever witnessed gout or for those of you that have gout, you know what I'm talking about, okay? We'll usually see this in men, all right? But usually either my age or older, right? What will happen is you have these crystals, they're called uric acid crystals, and what will happen, this, uh, this uric acid will crystallize inside of these joints, right? And it's like adding like glass to your joints, all right? It's very painful. And in fact, that's what it feels like. It feels like a cutting kind of, uh, 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 an immense amount of pain. And there's a condition, gouty arthritis, called podegra, in which it usually will attack, right, the, the joint of your big toe. And that big toe can become so, so painful and so sensitive to things that you can't even put a bed sheet. That's one of the first things I ask a patient that is complaining of gout if they don't know that they have it. I said, when you're sleeping at night, are you able to sleep with a bed sheet on your toe? If they say no, then I know that they've got gouty arthritis going on from the uric acid crystals that have built up in the joint, okay? Osteoarthritis, or OA, this is the most common one um, in which that you've probably heard about, the old man with the bad knees or grandpa, you know, he's got bad fingers or whatever, all right? So you're going to see this. This is the wear and tear arthritis, all right? So we're going to see it in the older people, all right? So what we've done is that we've worn away that articular cartilage there. Okay. Now that articular cartilage is gone, the bone is starting to get damaged. When that bone is getting damaged, it causes inflammation, right? And guess what? Then that inflammation cascades, right, with pain. It can cause further degeneration of the joint. So you can start to snowball, okay? So you'll see the, this type of arthritis in areas that undergo a lot of movement, okay? So your shoulders, Knees especially because they they see a lot of movement, but also compression the hips, right? Even in the in the spine, right? Fingers, knuckles, especially for folks if they've done a lot of annual labor, not necessarily, but where they're using their hands a lot for many many years, they'll start to see this type of arthritis. It's very common. And then finally, the last one is rheumatoid arthritis. Some of you may have heard of this RA. Okay, it is an autoimmune disorder. You need to know that. Right? And unfortunately, um, ladies, you are more prone to autoimmune disorders, so we'll see this type of arthritis more common right, in women, okay? Except for this type of arthritis, we'll see it in younger to middle-aged people. Essentially, what will happen is that synovial membrane that you see in the joints, right, in the uh, capsule there, it becomes inflamed. It'll create this structure called a panis, and this panis um, is this kind of soft tissue formation 
uh, uh, that actually starts to degenerate, very painful, uh, the joint itself. Right? But mainly it's from that synovial membrane inflammation there that we see. And so you can get tested for it, okay? You can get a test to see if you are uh, rheumat rheumatoid uh, um, factor, positive or negative, see if you're prone to it. All righty, well, that concludes uh, the Chapter 9 review. I, I know you folks have your tests coming up on uh, Tuesday, Wednesday. I'm going to send out uh, a, a, um, uh, an announcement just to remind everybody, okay? Um, I would definitely, if you haven't uh, taken advantage of, watch those videos, okay? It's very important that you watch the videos. Um, and I would make sure um, that you got to complete your write-up of the uh, of this Blackboard assignment and submit it by tonight, okay? So please, please do that. Uh, any questions about anything? No, okay. Good. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad it was helpful for you. I would say, you know, keep up with those notes. All right. And make sure that uh, if you do have questions, email me, text me, or not text me, but email me. Keep my phone nearby. I'm usually pretty good about checking it. In regards to a degenerative joint condition, once degeneration has begun and cartilage has been destroyed. Oh, darn it. Hold on one second. Well, it depends. Again, it depends on how bad the degeneration is occurring. It depends. There's several factors involved. Uh, one is the age of the patient, um, how bad it is. Uh, in, in, in some cases, it can be a lot of the times when a patient becomes symptomatic with the pain, um, and age plays a role in that, uh, there can be, you know, very minimal uh, degeneration, or it, it can be uh, pretty significant. The problem is, depending on the patient, you know, if they're living, I hear it all the time, you know, your body starts to give you signs you know, mild signs from time to time, but a lot of people just kind of shake it off. They shrug it off. They don't, um, they're like, ah, oh, that's nothing. It'll get better in a week and it doesn't get better. It'll get better, you know, in a couple of weeks. Um, and sometimes if the pain's not significant enough, they just don't really pay it much mind. They might take uh, anti-inflammatory medication, which is like putting a Band-Aid on, on the, uh, the issue. Um, so if it gets pretty significant, uh, you can just treat the, the symptoms. In some cases, if it's like the knee joint or the hip joint, then a joint replacement joint replacement can occur. Um, but if it's pretty early on and, and it's not too significant, you can treat it, try to restore the normal biomechanics. PT is great. Uh, manipulation, making sure that the joint is mobile and undergoing the proper biomechanics. But yeah, there's a couple different ways to do it. It just really depends on the um, prognosis, uh, how severe the condition is. That's a good question. Any other questions from you folks? Yeah, I'm going to actually try to uh, put it up as soon as uh, we're done here. All right? Usually it takes a couple minutes for the server to download it, so I can um, put it on the uh, on Blackboard for you. But yeah. Good. I'm glad the supplements do help. All righty, folks. Well, if there's no other questions, y'all have a good night. Keep studying hard. And I will start to uh, put out uh, Chapter 12, the nervous system, uh, during the week. Keep an eye out for Quizlets and uh, those um, videos, those review sessions. All right, folks, I'm going to take off. Uh, have a wonderful evening.